I think we, we clearly have all our members here and I think we have probably most of the public and I don't want to hold up any longer. So with that, let's call the meeting to order. I want to thank you all for being here this afternoon. Uh, let's take a roll call quickly to establish the quorum and then we'll move into the meat of the agenda. So Michelle, would you mind taking roll call? Um, member D. Giovanni. Present. Member Schneider. Present. Member Royce. Present. Okay, yep. so we, uh, we have a quorum, so let's move into the meat of the meeting. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here today. The agenda today is, is focused around a uh, response letter to the FAA recent uh, neighborhood environmental study or noise study. And we do have a number of the public on the line and they have some great comments. So that's where we'll be spending our time. We have a couple presenters to kick us off that we'll get into. Before we get into that though, we'd like to open it up for any public comment for items not on the agenda. If you'd like to make a public comment uh, consistent with our Zoom protocol, please raise your hand or uh, push star nine and we'll recognize you if you're on, the, on a phone. Uh, are there any public comments on non-agenda items? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I do have one hand raised from Ms. Darlene Yapley. So give me one second so I could share my screen um, for a timer. And I will first call on Ms. Darlene Yapley. Please accept this request to unmute your microphone and begin speaking. Hello, Darlene, how are you? Hey there, thank you. Uh, I appreciate you including in today's packet Ann Kohut's airport noise report, which summarizes aviation legislation for the current 117th Congress. There's many important bills from Rep Spear that could be reintroduced for the new Congress. And I would like to encourage the leg subcommittee to schedule a future meeting to discuss the legislation topic overall. Thank you so much. A great idea. So thank you for the right su suggestion. So, Thank you, Ms. Yapley. And I do have another hand raised by Ms. Sue Degree. Sue, okay. Hello, that. Sue. Hello, Sue, and welcome. Uh, Hello. Thank you. I'm so glad you, you still meet. I'm very pleased that the Legislative Committee still goes. I was able to attend most of the uh, workshops at the seminar for aviation, uh, which Darlene was a speaker. And uh, there were some very promising things. And so I'm not quite sure what's on the agenda. Sorry, I forgot. But uh, I, I um, concur with what Darlene just said. And there's so much hope still. And I just really appreciated how advocacy was still a very, very, very important thing that will help us all. So let's not forget that. And thank you so much again for continuing the legislative committee. Thank you, Sue. We appreciate your comments. Are there other uh, speakers from the public on non-agenda items? Um, Chairman, sorry, we do not have any more hands raised from the public. Okay, with that, we'll close the public comment. I would add, without objection, I might add a public comment at the end too, in case uh, there's stuff you think is gonna be covered today that might not be, and give you a chance to make a comment then. With that, let's move into the meat of the agenda, and that is the FAA Aircraft Noise Policy and Research. Um, as you may recall, that legislative committee has been asked to prepare a, let a comment letter to respond and provide feedback and suggestions and recommendations to the FAA with respect to what's next and what we observe with respect to their neighborhood environmental study. Uh, this is due by March 15th. Uh, we'll walk through a timetable on how we anticipate meeting that deadline in just a minute, but wanted to note that we are uh, encouraging public comment on this as well. Uh, we know there's a lot of people who are much smarter than we are, members of the public, they have some opinions on this and we would welcome your input. So we are gonna try to be a little flexible with respect to providing you the opportunity to do so. Um, there are three categories they asked us to comment on. Uh, and I would just allude to them quickly. One is what additional research analysis, investigation uh, do we think need to be done? Including any kind of communications around reductions, abatement, mitigation of noise or noise modeling metrics. The second category is input is to the factors contributing to the increase in noise. And they give examples around survey methodology, changes in aircraft operation, abatement, 
uh, distribution of how people live and work, societal response. And the third category they specifically asked for input on is any, if it, what if any additional categories of research should be undertaken. I might add, well, those are the three categories they specifically would like to have comments on. It does not preclude us from commenting on any other aspect with respect to the study. So I would open that up as well when you make your comments. So with that, we have a couple of presentations to kick us out and we'll move right into those without objection. Hearing no objection, uh, Emily, we'll turn the, the floor over to you if you don't mind, representing NOISE, the board recommendations. Thank you so much. Thanks all for having me today. Um, my uh, presentation today is really I will be sharing my screen in just a moment with our with the organization's uh, public comment that was approved by our board last uh, last Monday. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of background first um, to let you know how we arrived at this. Um, First of all, I think you all know as you're engaged with this, this is, I consider this, our board considers this a sort of a watershed moment for aviation policy, noise policy, the, the stakeholder community that we're all engaging, we all engage with. Um, this is the first time in decades that there has been a movement towards addressing how the FAA uh, policy measures noise. And um, if you've heard me talk before about top down and bottom up approach, what you all do at your round table um, with your consultants and with the airport and with the FAA is what works um, and what needs to work for SFO and for your surrounding communities. And that's very, very important and it's ongoing and it's critical towards um, addressing noise impacts. But there's the other piece, which is federal policy. And that is something that all communities, whether they are impacted by the largest, busiest airports, uh, general aviation airports, um, whether they're impacted by next gen or by whatever expansion at an airport, um, how the FAA measures noise is very, very key to all communities. And we as an organization have always contended and much more so since the dawn of next gen and performance based navigation that the FAA needs to measure noise impact differently. That DNL, humans don't hear in averages, um, it's not adequate. Um, in, in most all cases to, to address or to capture the impact um, of aviation noise on residents on airport adjacent and non-adjacent now communities. So that is uh, where we are coming from as an organization. And in, in addition to that, you know, I think it's, it's um, important to just say that we have been um, a proponent of looking at new metrics for for many, many years. And we feel that this, and, and have been tracking as you all have this, this survey, this study, and wait anxiously awaiting its, um, its uh, uh, release for, for years. And I, I, I've been tracking this all the way back since 2007. So uh, very, very um, you know, happy that it's here and looking forward to this opportunity for community or excuse me, public comment. However, I also think that it's important to say that the noise organization believes that this public comment period should be the first step towards engaging with the FAA in this, um, in this very, you know, sort of broad, unique and what would likely be a long term um, opportunity or, or engagement process to look at noise metrics and to look at noise federal policy. So we came at, and I, as I talk, I will just now, if it's okay, share my screen. Um, uh, it is, um, we, because we believe this is the first step, our, our public comment really took the tact of saying, this is where we are coming from as an organization. This is what we have how we have engaged in the past, what we believe about noise impacts and, and how DNL does is inadequate and what we think that we should, that the FAA should be offering um, or should be investigating as um, noise impacts rather than just uh, what the Schultz curve has, uh, has measured in the past. So just as an example here, um, we, we think that, and we understand also, which we mentioned that this is not a small undertaking, that this is a very, very large undertaking, but should consider uh, measuring the psychological impacts of concentrated extended noise, um, the psychological uh, and physiological cardiovascular impact, uh, impact of, in, 
of infrequent significant noise spikes during nighttime hours. So, you know, this, the sleeping impact, impact of less audible, low frequency noise that's vibration induces audible noise, um, shaking of homes. And this is, this is going to be different at different airports, but these are the kinds of things they should be investigating. The length of each period of frequent regular noise spikes or rush hours due to overflights, the number of rush hours per day, the average dB of a rush hour's noise, not day-night average, the intensity of spikes above ambient dB during rush hour noise, and the intensity and number of spikes above the ambient for non-rush hour from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. Um, and I think it's also important to note that um, that noise as an organization has supported um, DNL as a 55 level, um, uh, 55 DNL as, as an appropriate level. But I think with this advent um, in tandem with encouraging the FAA to look at new metrics is very important. So I'm not sure as an organization if we will take that off our legislative priority list or caveat it with, you know, in the meantime, we should be measuring to the 55 or mitigating to the 55. Um, so I'm going to just pause in a, a moment. Um, I, I know I may not take up my whole 15 minutes, but what I really wanted to end on here is um, that what the organization truly believes and what we want to represent on behalf of our members and, and have input on is this next step, is that public comment is important. This is one benchmark in this, what we think is now the start of a very, very important season for the FAA. And we understand again that this is, we do not ask lightly that the FAA focuses on this and really puts effort, time, you know, all of the things um, and, and funding behind this. And it's not just up to the FAA, Congress has to fund them. And so we want to be as an organization, a partner and an ally for the FAA in this endeavor to uh, beyond just this public comment period to be working um, to you know, communicate and have transparent um, dialogue about what these metrics should look like, um, because this is really the opportunity to shape policy. And so we're going to be stressing that in this public comment we do, and then moving forward. But we also want to stress to Congress that this is it. This is a big, important thing for the Quiet Skies Caucus and for members who are part of it, but who have these impacted areas, um, and to be communicating with both the Quiet Skies Caucus and members who are who have interest in this and the budget committees, the appropriations committees, and the, the committees that mandate the FAA to move forward with next gen technologies, we really want to say that all of these folks, all of these stakeholders should be communicating and we want to, you know, advocate for increased funding to make sure that these very, very, very vital policy um, considerations are properly um, invested in by our federal government and that the FAA can actually move forward with this and not just have a mandate to do this because you know we want to ask our members of Congress to to, um, to really ha have them prioritize this and, and move forward with this study but that they are actually funded to do this and come up with meaningful metrics um, that really capture the new and the nuanced uh, impact on airport um, adjacent and now non-adjacent communities. So I know I didn't take up much of my time, but or all of my time, but um, I know we may have questions, I think, Michelle, but really I just wanted to make sure you had an understanding of where this, um, this statement came from. And we really as well encourage for, I think the most important thing is that we encourage um, noise members, roundtables, individual communities for there to be a just groundswell of public comment on this. And you all, uh, Michelle and, and other roundtable members should have been invited to noise is having a virtual meeting on March 3rd. Um, it's uh, two to four uh, central. So that makes it um, noon to two Pacific on Wednesday the 3rd. And that will be a meeting that of no, for noise members and friends that are welcome um, that um, can join us to, we, were, we are gonna be addressed by um, Congresswoman Holmes Norton, who is the chair of the Quiet Skies uh, Caucus right now. She's the DC delegate. And then we'll be talking about our public comment, getting input from members and discussing, you know, ways that noise can support uh, folks to do their public comment, which I think your round table is, is really, um, and this committee is doing um, very well. 
Um, but so if folks would like to join us, I know Michelle has the invite and is, is joining others. I can um, share it in whatever capacity makes sense or you can forward it to whoever you'd like. But we really look forward to that as, as our sort of our um, input on all of the FAA, you know, um, webinars that they're doing, you're, you're doing this today. That's the noise organization's um, uh, process for, for sharing all of this with our membership. So that's what I've got today. And I just really appreciate you having me and I'm excited to hear from the rest of the panels and your questions and all that to learn even more. Thank you, Emily. Uh, we're going to take uh, questions or comments from the, from the committee and hold public comment until after Jean and Justin have completed their presentation. So we can take a comment on both presentations at the same time and make sure we have an opportunity to lay the foundation for our discussion. So right now, uh, I think, Anne, I see your hand is up. If you have a question or comment, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you Al. Um, Ms. Tranter, thank you. Would you mind scrolling your, your sheet up to see the bullet points that were the previous page? I have to admit that I am still absorbing everything from last week's symposium and trying to digest what was different this year from last year. What I heard was, especially for communities close into airports, that many speakers said, well, you know, it's not just airport noise, it's also the freeways around them. I have, in the time since, talked to my city manager about that. And in one part, for those of us close in, we do need to recognize all noise sources, but we also said, well, maybe that's a little concerning that airports might say, hey, it's not all us, it's that freeway. I don't know if noise is looking at that, and I may not have expressed it well, because as I said, I'm still trying to absorb all of that. The second thing that I'm looking at SFO, and I'm from Millbrae, and I am actually didn't realize just how darn close I was to runways one, but during COVID, when there are fewer passengers, the airlines have added more freight. The heavier the plane, the greater the low frequency noise, the greater the vibration on takeoff. Okay, goods do need to be delivered, but is that better during the day? Or how many of them are trying to do their 24 hour turnaround by taking off in the middle of the night? This is my long way of saying, you know what? maybe I'm a little more empathetic for a person that needs to get to Washington DC in time for work the following morning, like our Congresswoman, I am less sympathetic to freight. And I don't know if noise is looking at the difference between freight and human passengers. And as uh, I read something, oh, it was Bart saying it's gonna take until the end of the 2020s to recover post COVID traffic. If the airport takes five years and every airport takes five years, they're gonna be backfilling that with freight. And really should people's sleep be destroyed to move freight in 24 hours? I don't agree. Medical, medical vaccines, that's different, but freight, no. Right. So I don't know if noise has thought about that. Emily, would like to comment? Yeah, um, so on the on the um, highway noise, you know, honestly, I I participated in about half of last week's um, UC Davis. Um, I'm not, I have not heard from other members about, you know, the sort of impact. I know what we've been focusing on a little bit more is that it, you don't just have to be airport adjacent anymore because of the concentration to be bothered by airport noise. So it is just evolving. And I think it's important. It's an important consideration to think about. So I appreciate you um, raising that. I haven't, we haven't had um, much conversation about it to, to date. In terms of freight, um, it is certainly something that is on our proverbial radar um, because of COVID. And, you know, we have, it's very interesting because we're at this really odd intersection of nothing is stopping in terms of our, our I'm talking about our as a stakeholder community work, um, nothing's stopping there um, because of COVID. And, and it's actually, I've encouraged the FAA in, in certain conversations to really take this time to address airport noise. And I think, you know, when, when capacity is down, um, and so I think we are moving so rapidly for this study being released in the public comment case in point, but their, but their capacity or their, their um, employments are way down, their passengers are way down. And so it's important to consider that, you know, if they're backfilling with freight, what we have to consider those impacts and not just go full steam ahead. So in terms of your question, it is something that we've been talking about. 
Um, we've been, to be, you know, fully honest, really focused on this the last couple of, uh, since January. Um, and, uh, but I will add this to board consideration to make sure that I'm hearing from, you know, that we're asking other airport members or air, airport community members what they're hearing and, and what, if we need to address that formally, formally. but um, it's certainly something that we should consider not just letting go by the wayside if this is gonna be the next eight years. Thank you. And, and Al, if I could ask one more. I've never oh. heard um, the term that you use, and I love it, that there are peak times when planes are flying, peak times when they're taking off, uh, rush hour. I think you use the term rush hour. So I, I appreciate that. And it makes me think about the other things that you're looking at, the 24 hour, 365 a year averaging, and then how ambient noise is used. I was gardening yesterday and a really loud motorcycle went by and I go, gosh, does that motorcycle get to be multiplied over 24 hours so that right. my city's ambient noise level is increased? So I, I think you're already there and I'm still learning how to, to, to understand this, how, FAA uses ambient noise and how that hurts cities because, you know, they shouldn't say, oh, Milbray, your average decibel layer is already at 50 degree or 50 decibels versus Portola Valley is only at 30 decibels. I'd love to see us dive more into that so that I can have a better grasp of it. But I think some communities are penalized because of where they're located. That's a good point. And I, and something that I think should be considered as they move forward with, you know, and, and should, if there's part of that to be public comment for the city of Millbrae or for the round table, you know, I think if that is, um, is certainly important to capture and what you want them to make sure they're aware of. Right. Yeah. Thank and you. I certainly don't want to make say, oh, Portola Valley, you should have to raise your limits. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that that frequent, infrequent motorcycle or the leaf blowers or the lawn mowers that happen once a week in one particular spot, I think are getting overly weighted. I think that's where I'm coming okay. from, but um, hopefully Justin can help me understand this better okay. uh, or help us understand it better. Thank you, Ann. Pamela, did you have any questions or comments? I see you're muted, Pam. Pam, I think you're muted. My apology. Okay. Um, other than I think it's great to address uh, the psychological issues that people don't appear sometimes to think about and hearing for that people are home during the COVID and having a lot more stress to be more aware of that um, by working from home. So I think that you highlighted that, which is uh, important of uh, people, the phone calls that I've been getting from uh, constituents. That's a very important uh, aspect of it and how it's affecting them. So um, I appreciate that you included that in the um, in your bullet points for sure, or, as well as the others. But I know that people don't really think about that sometimes. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Bayer. Thank you. I just have a couple of quick questions and I'll save the bulk of them for after we finish the other presentation. But Emily, uh, from, your, from the noise uh, perspective, from your perspective, were there any surprises in this report? Anything that uh, struck you as what you were not expecting or what you expected that wasn't there? I think the whole thing was pretty stunning. Um, you know, I, I think I think that the whole thing was stunning because, you know, it, I, but it was sort of like, duh. I mean, I don't mean that to be so glib, but, you know, airport noise impacted communities know that noise is disruptive and we know that it disrupts the sleep and that it's annoying and that it's harmful and so what was stunning about it was to have this the 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 number be so starkly supportive of of what you know anecdotally or what you know kind of how we discuss it as a as a non-technical stakeholder community um and 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 so it was it was such a big jump, but I, I don't, I wasn't surprised in the sense that I, that I think it was, it is, you know, that's what we've been saying all along the, the collective we, right. Is that noise is, is, is really disruptive. And, and it is, um, I think just very important that this survey, um, 
came to the same conclusion. And so this is why it's so important to be engaging in this right now. It's just sort of the, the call to arms, the, what all, you know, all of the euphemisms you want to use. Um, so nothing surprised me other than, than, um, it was a good surprise, I think was, is how I would put it. And then my second question is, is comment, and it is going to apply to, I think, our letter as well as your letter, is uh, while noise is certainly the thing that gets the most attention and is clearly most disturbing to people, I don't want to lose sight of the fact there's, there's a health impact and there's, the, as you alluded to, the physiological impact as well as the psychological impact. And I, I don't think that should be diminished at all in our discussion. And the, and the pollutive impact, the, the particles, the ultrafine particles, I think that needs to be focused on too, because to deal with this, I think you need a coalition that's focused on more than just noise. It's broader than that. And so I was glad to see your comments there. Although um, I think we might want to add to those a little bit in, in our letters at the same time. Yeah, and noise has always had the struggle of, you know, if we if we 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 understand, and I think everyone who who cares about noise cares about non-noise environmental impacts, mm -hmm. but our sort of charter has been so specific to noise. But you're you're absolutely right. The particle impact, the you know the the all of the environmental impacts, the climate impact is is very important to address. And so I'd encourage we would encourage all of our members to include that. And we are certainly not. Um, you know, shying away from from addressing it. It's just on on the when we we're kind of laser focused right now. Great, thank you. Uh, and before we go to the public, before we do the next presentation, then go to the public for their comments and thoughts. I know they'll have some great ones. Any other comments from members uh, on the committee uh, with respect to Emily's presentation? And Kathleen Wentworth, I know you've joined us. Uh, I have a question for you after Justin's presentation. Would like to have you respond to the comment about uh, congressional uptake and the congressional review at one of our next meetings and what might be going on from that perspective. So I'll just give you an advance warning of that right now, if that's okay. But um, Michelle, did you have any questions or comments specifically? I don't, thank you. Justin? I don't. Okay, any thank others? You, yeah, I won't go through the roll. With that, if that's okay, let's move to the next item on the agenda, and that's the report from Jean and from Justin. So, gentlemen, the floor is yours. Emily, you Justin, might have you to stop to... sharing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there we go. I think I got it. There you go. There you go, Jean. Thank you. Can, can you hear me? We yes, can. thank you. Yes, yes. Okay, great. I always like to check because I don't want to talk for five minutes before I find out people aren't listening or people aren't hearing. Um, so um, thanks for this opportunity. I'm uh, glad to be able to provide some additional background to um, a number of research efforts undergone, have been undergone by the FAA over um, some recent years. And so if you want to go on to the next slide, Justin, and we'll get right into it. Um, and the FAA's noise research program works to understand the impacts of aircraft noise on human health and welfare. And it's through partnerships with industry, academia, and government stakeholders, the FAA aims to guide investments in scientific studies, analytic tools, and innovative technologies to better understand and manage aircraft noise. So the FAA noise research really can be categorized into three major areas shown here. First, determining the effects of aircraft noise on individuals and communities, improving noise modeling, noise metrics, and environmental data visualization. And lastly, developing solutions to reduce noise at its source, abate noise through operations and mitigate the effects of noise on communities. So the Federal Register notice provides additional details on the progress made and ongoing work for each of the topics listed on this slide, which we'll go into further detail um, on each next slide. So the three areas for the effects of aircraft noise are neighbor the NES or Neighborhood Environmental Survey, speech interference and children's learning and then health and human impact. Next slide, please. So for the NES, um, the FAA published the results in January, and um, that is one of the things that it's up for public comment at this point. Basically, this included a new national curve that um, shows a substantial increase in percent of people highly annoyed by aircraft noise. 
when compared to the existing FICON curve, which is also known as the Schultz curve. Um, so you can see that um, dramatic difference that uh, the noise presentation was alluding to and, you know, that dramatic change there. Next slide. In terms of speech interference and children's learning, the EPA conducted studies on those in the 70s, which um, they have come out to say is still relevant today. And actually a 2014 ACRP study showed that even moderate levels of aircraft noise exposure can impact children's learning. And over 50% of teachers felt that aircraft noise interfered um, with communication and felt that aircraft noise caused students to lose concentration. However, the FAA is not currently conducting research in this area due to challenges in designing effective studies, but is investigating whether there are areas warranting further study, like the potential effects of aviation noise on reading comprehension and learning motivation in children. Next slide. Um, a little bit further, as part of the ASCENT program, FAA is working with the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine to conduct a national sleep study. And I wanna stop here real quick just to introduce the ASCENT program. That is a program that the FAA has had ongoing for a number of years now, maybe even approaching a decade or more. And that is to work with academia to really um, conduct research for the FAA. So whenever I mention the ASCENT program, that's what that is. That's a collective a group of industry, FAA, and academia to kind of all work together and figure out um, where to put the, the uh, dollars for research. So two pilot studies um, to assess feasibility methodology were completed to inform further research. The study was conducted around Philadelphia and completed around 2016 and Atlanta around 2019. And the outcomes here or anticipated outcomes from the National Sleep Study uh, collectively nationally, collect nationally representative information on probability of, a, of a, being awoken by aircraft noise and include a detailed field study where subjects will collect um, EKG or electrocardiography and noise data in their homes. Um, advanced understanding of the physiological effects of aircraft noise on sleep. So in terms of cardiovascular health, again, Ascent is working um, with the FAA and Boston University School of Public Health to better understand the relationship um, between cardiovascular health and aircraft noise. Um, they're doing a literature review currently um, and the research published in 2018. And then a national study applying aircraft noise exposure over multiple years to health um, studies spanning several airports. Um, next was uh, th also through the ASCENT program, FA worked with MIT or is working with them to build upon uh, the prior research that revealed the willingness of people to actually pay to avoid aircraft noise exposure. So two additional studies there we're looking at are the economic impacts to businesses located under flight paths and also um, the impact of aircraft noise on the transaction values for residential properties. So to address a couple of the economic impacts from aircraft noise exposure. Next slide. Uh, now we'll move on to the um, noise modeling, noise metrics, environmental data visualization. This will include the AEDT, which is the FAA's model for all things environmental, sort of. It's the air quality emissions, fuel burn, um, in, in addition to noise. So it's their uh, model they have compiled or um, put together a number of models that they used to have all into the aviation environmental design tool. There's also a noise screening tool that they use and environmental data visualization and then supplemental noise metrics. Next slide. Uh, I believe we're on slide 10, Justin, just to be sure we're on the same page here. Um, so AEDT, noise visualization and environmental data visualization. That's a mouthful to say. Um, <laughs> Anyway, the FAA um, developed the ADT um, to uh, be their recommended tool at this point. And they've also designed an environmental visualization tool to take advantage of the availability of high quality geospatial data to deliver an agency wide resource using a consistent common visual language. And so the FAA 
is developing an updated noise screening tool that will use a simplified modeling process to facilitate expedited review of proposed federal actions where significant impacts are not expected. So if significant impacts are expected, then they would not use a screening tool. Or if they use the screening tool and the screening tool showed that it would be, it, it may lead to actually more significant noise impacts than they were expecting, they would go back and use AEDT. So it's, it, it really is to think of that is the name of it is right. It's a screening tool that they would use to determine um, whether, you know, what they're proposing might produce significant noise impacts. And then the implementation of the environmental visualization tool will help communicate aircraft noise to the public. And that's really the impetus for developing that visualization tool. So the next slide is talking about supplemental metrics. Um, as you know, in 2020, the report to Congress found that cumulative metrics, DNL, CNEL, um, were best suited to address the Aviation Safety and Noise Abatement Act of 1979 or ASNA requirements that a metric account for, and this is again, ASNA required, that the metric account for noise level, time of day, and number of events. Um, and so the FAA continues to recommend use of DNL for FAA decision-making regarding noise compatibility. Continuation of the FICON decision reached in 1992, reaffirmed in 2018 with the Federal Interagency Committee on Aviation Noise. Now, of course, this report to Congress um, was out before the NES results were out. Not sure if that changes things, but right now they have said that policy isn't changing as a result of this, but they're looking for input from the public at this point before they proceed with, with other things such as policy changes if they were to do any. So now moving on to the reduction, abatement, and mitigation of aviation noise. Um, there are three items there, aircraft noise source reduction, noise abatement, and noise mitigation research. Um, so the FAA's principal environmental effort to accelerate development of new aircraft and engine technologies is the CLEAN program. CLEAN stands for Continuous Lower Energy Emissions and Noise. Um, for noise, the goal is pretty, um, it's a pretty big goal, and it's actually to reduce noise levels um, by 32 decibels relative to the stage four aircraft or 25 decibels relative to stage five noise standard. And so um, progress in there in clean um, phases one and two, the FAA worked with selected industry partners like Boeing, GE, uh, Boeing, you know, is an aircraft manufacturer, GE and Rolls-Royce are engine aircraft engine manufacturers, and they've contributed almost nearly 400 million of cost share to the clean program, exceeding, you know, the, the FAA contribution of just over 200 million. Several projects completed under clean have successfully developed technology that has the potential to reduce noise, which if we go to the next slide, we'll show an example of that. And the aircraft on the right is showing um, Aurora Flight Sciences, their double bubble advanced aircraft concept, which is estimated to actually um, reduce noise by 16 dB. We're talking their goal being, um, you know, even greater than 25, but this is a step in the right direction. It, it changes um, the um, design of the fuselage or the, you know, print, the perimeter of the airframe, you know, and um, moving the engine so that it's shielded by the airframe as well. You see the engines up above the, the airframe rather than below the engine. So that's together how you get 16 dB um, reduction in noise. And so this um, clean program is continuing. Um, they're expected um, commercial aircraft to be um, off the um, production line by 2026 that have some of these concepts integrated into the newer designs of aircraft. And then um, they actually anticipate announcing the awardees of the phase three programs um, early this year. So probably uh, another month or two, if not sooner. Next slide. Um, so progress. Um, use of voluntary noise abatement departure procedures is a long-standing technical technique to reduce noise. So um, continued use of what we call NADPs and also FAA is exploring better ways 
um, exploring ways to better control flight paths and try to find flight paths that avoid noise sensitive areas. And they're doing a lot of that research also through ASCENT. Um, some outcomes that have already happened um, or things that actually hasn't already happened, but ongoing support with MIT um, to improve the fidelity, accuracy, and utility of noise analysis techniques for advanced operational procedures, and then uh, working with the Volpe Center for helicopter noise abatement procedures. Next slide. Further on the noise mitigation research, um, we've already talked about the report to Congress um, where um, Actually, this is a different report to Congress in the same year, but this is where they looked at the speed, the effect of speed on aircraft and the noise on the ground if you change the speed of the aircraft. Um, and what was found in that report to Congress, uh, the FAA reported that changes in aircraft climb speed do not have an appreciable impact on overall aircraft departure noise because the dominance really is the engine noise. And so slowing the aircraft down, you're still producing similar um, noise from from the engines um, so they didn't see a, a huge or any much to report anyway any change in the noise levels expected if you change the speed for departing aircraft however for arriving three aircraft if you yep just Somebody three minutes said, oh thank you um i think i'll make it <laughs> um so on arrival however if you delay the deceleration of the aircraft um, this could have a noticeable change of about four to eight dB um, between 10 and 25 nautical miles out from the runway. Now, th remember, that's not out from the airport necessarily in distance because you do a downwind arrival sometimes and come in. So it just depends it, its track length um, to the airport. And so um, a de delayed deceleration of the aircraft could actually um, decrease noise four to eight dB, but more research is needed to really validate the potential benefits there. Next slide, which is essentially the last slide, um, which is why we're meeting now. And that's the fact that the FAA does want to hear from the commun communities um, and what they think about um, in terms of factors that may be contributing to the increase in noise we've experienced since the Schultz curve and the FICON um, curve were um, produced. So um, what, what factors may be contributing to that? Also additional investigation or analysis, what else um, should, should the FAA be considering or looking at, including effects of aircraft noise on individuals and communities, the noise modeling and the other things that we talked about um, today. And then additional categories of investigation analysis or research, you know, what, what else should they be looking at to inform noise policy going forward. So with that, um, I will, I will end. So I'm um, sorry I was talking fast through some of it, but I know that we just um, wanted to have just 15 minutes to present this. Hopefully it provided good enough background for um, the round table to now have a have a good discussion and leading to um, how they may want to provide that public comment to the FAA. Great, thank, thank you Gene. for your time and listening. Yep. Thank, thank you, Gene. Appreciate it. Uh, Justin, did you have any comments you wanted to add on the report? Not, not at this time. Um, I'm happy to, you know, help answer any questions. And obviously, as we get into more discussion, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll help facilitate some of that. So. Great, thank you. Um, let's uh, see if there are any uh, comments from members of the committee. Uh, Anne, did you have any questions or comments? Yeah, a couple of questions. Thank you, Jean. And uh, uh, Michelle, we're gonna get to see both presentations because I need a little bit more time to look at them and think about them. Um, I'm looking at the slide that Jean showed that had 16 EPNDBs, cumulative noise reductions. And it made me think the problem I have in trying to, we hear people talking about in-flight noise and then for the ground-based noise committee, we're talking about uh, takeoff departure noise. And I think, it, I think I'm getting to the point where I would appreciate it if the FAA disaggregated the various noise types that high frequency noise and if we're looking at a stage four engine or plane design to a stage five to someday stage six, that we're looking at high frequency noise as one aspect, 
low frequency noise vibration. And I'm assuming in this picture of this new plane, it's also reducing cabin noise. So it's just hard to compare. We're not comparing apples and apples. We've got these different things. And when I see people say, oh, it's so much quieter stage four and the new stage fives, well, not when it comes to low frequency noise. And in fact, we had a, a member of the public at our round table a couple of weeks ago saying that in fact, the low frequency noise has increased as, jet, as, as we've moved to improved high frequency noise. So what is the chance of disaggregating this noise? And the FAA has to recognize this instead of averaging them. My gut feeling is we don't work on low frequency noise because it's hard, it's difficult, it can't, we keep being told it can't be done. So we're only working on high frequency. Great. Justin or Al, did you want me to comment yeah, on that? Yes, if you would. Sure. If and so um, one thing, one thing, Anne, is that um, to the FAA and to the aircraft manufacturers, they believe they are doing an apples to apples comparison. And I understand your viewpoint. I just want you to also um, understand theirs. They, de they determined many, many decades ago now, you know, that, that they would use EPNDV, which is the effective perceived noise level um, to um, address um, and to measure aircraft noise for certification purposes. So what that has done is put that on a level playing field to them in that they have an arrival noise level, they have a sideline noise level, and they have a departure noise level as all part of the um, certification of um, jet powered aircraft. And um, so when they go to certify, that's what they're certifying are those three location points. And so to them, they are, um, you know, comparing the same thing from stage, you know, pre-stage two all the way up to stage five at this point. But your point is, is well made and probably something that you may want to put into your comments is that you think it's, it's you know, high time to address low frequency noise concerns for people sideline and behind start of takeoff roll because um, that's predominantly where that low frequency noise um, is generated and promulgated out to the community. So I just wanted to let you know what the 16 decibel reduction really was alluding to, um, but I think your point is still well made. Right. Thank you, Gene. And so I use the right terminology, sidelined and behind are the two aspects we need to start speaking, bringing up more often. And yeah, then so I'm gonna just, go backwards. Just be aware and just real quick, be aware that they do a sideline measurement now as part of the certification, but it's it's in, in EPNDB. So to the effect that EPNDB has low frequency noise and there is low frequency noise in that, but it's not specifically looking at low frequency. So again, I think your comment, if you address just low frequency noise, but the, where low fre frequency noise is important is typically behind and sideline to the departure role. Thank you. Michelle, what that means when we have our next ground-based noise meeting, I, this is that glossary that we need, this better understanding of where low frequency noise comes in. And I'll, I'll take that off. My only other comment, you had another chart that showed uh, the various noise functions over time. It doesn't include duration. It has the high point of noise, the frequency of noise, but not duration. So if you, what, what I experience, especially between 10 o'clock and three o'clock in the morning is planes taking off constantly and the duration is almost running hour by hour. So I think we need to push for duration. Yeah, as I an additional metric that to was that. On. Justin, if you can find that, it's about the um, report to Congress. Um, yeah, go later in the report. presentation. Yeah. You'll see it. It has three columns, and duration yep, is not one of the columns. There, it's that's a, it. Page 11. Yeah, there, there it is. is. Yeah. yeah. So it's noise level, time of day, and number of events. So that right. those are the three Without, things. And so, Anne, you're correct. Right. I just wanted to, everybody to be level set here. But yes, those are the three things that. Again, it was ASNA or the um, Aircraft Safety and Noise Abatement Act 
um, created. They said you need to take into account noise level, time of day, and number of events. And so if you do want to make a comment to those three, like you said, then this is, you know, the time to do that is that we believe that there should be more taken into account than just those three, three items. Correct. Good. And I think the flying world has changed a lot from 1992. There are that many more planes. So even if they're quieter, there are that many more. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ann. Uh, Pam, I'm sorry. Pam, did you have any questions or comments? Yeah, no, to the chair, I just want to say that uh, I agree with her about the duration, to add a duration as well, because I think that's a component. So I agree with that. Thank you, Chair. And thank you for the presentation. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jean, I, I would uh, add uh, my thanks as well. Could I have a couple of quick questions before we get into uh, discussion and public input? On that slide um, 11, I guess right here, you talk about uh, the FAA 2020 report uh, in which Congress's um, report to Congress implies continuing the same metrics. Are, are you suggesting, or I'm hoping you're suggesting they're now open to a new recommendation, a new change with respect to that thought process based on this study? Is that your experience? Um, well, I am not going to speak for the FAA. Um, I try not to do that, um, but um, I don't know because they, they just did a report to Congress, right, last year that said they were still supporting the use of DNL or CNEL in California as mandated through Title 21. So I can't, I don't know, and I don't pretend to know whether they're considering other metrics at this time. Certainly with the results of the NES or Neighborhood Environmental Survey, um, that should be one of the things that they're considering, but you shouldn't assume that. And in fact, you may want to assume the opposite in your comments to make sure that they know that this is something that's important to you. Okay, that's what I thought, but I just wanted to get your input on that. Uh, secondly, uh, just a quick question. One of your slides, you talked about the reduction uh, by 32 dBs. Uh, is that the average? Is, are you looking at the averages or are you looking at the heights? Or how, what does that 32 dB reduction mean? Yeah, so again, there are three measurement locations when they do um, noise certification of aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, there's sideline, departure, and arrival. Mm -hmm. And so it is the aggregate of those three that when you put them together, you are reducing the noise level overall by 32 dB. So not all of those measurement points may reduce 32 dB. Some may be more, some may be less, but when you aggregate them together, you're getting a 32 dB um, reduction. And that's what the clean goal is, is to um, 32 relative to stage four and 25 relative to stage five. So you would get that reduction, but it's not equal everywhere. It may be more on arrival, maybe more on departure. You just don't know exactly where they'll, the give and takes are. But that's part of the um, research programs going on is what can we get and how can we get it? And you saw from the, I think it's the next slide, Justin, with the change of the airframe, is that they are really looking at airframe noise on arrival because arrival noise has become um, pretty dominant in, in, at a lot of airports now over departure noise. But there's still, you see, reducing departure noise or engine noise because they're moving the engines to have the airplane actually shield them from the ground a little bit. Yeah, I noticed that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other comments before we go to the next step? Uh, hearing none, before we take public comment, I wonder if I could ask Michelle to sort of walk through our timetable on this because we do have a short timetable. I want to make sure we keep that in mind as we talk about our recommendations and timing for getting it done. So Michelle, would you mind walking us through the timetable? Oh, I think you muted it, Michelle. Buzzword of the 2020s, now 2020. I, I will. Um, the idea would be for me to get the letter, draft letter to the committee members tomorrow and you would have six days to review it. Then you would return any comments to me for modification. Um, you, I would do that on the 8th and 9th, and then it would go to Ricardo and Sam between the 10th and the 14th. That's the chair and vice chair. And then Al would have the AM of the 15th to review it, and then the PM will upload it uh, to the FAA website. 
Is, is it due the PM on the 15th or the beginning of the day? I, I thought I saw somewhere at the beginning of the 15th. I'm gonna let Angela answer that because she's in charge of that part. I have not finalized the time, but I will get that to you shortly. Okay. Uh, Linda, I see your hand is up. Any questions or comments? Yeah, hi, thanks, um, Mayor. Um, I had a question. Actually, Justin, would you mind pulling up the PowerPoint again back to that page 11? <clears throat> Sorry. So what I'm going to ask is also something that came up in the noise symposium last week, um, but it was about how, so this is um, regarding the ASNA requirements um, for using the cumulative metrics. Somebody brought up, and I want to say maybe it was Peter Kirsch in that, um, that uh, seminar about where in FAA operations the cumulative metrics are required. It's legislatively mandated that they are used and in other places where it was um, policy or um, practice to use cumulative metrics. So in other words, it's not, the latter group might be more low hanging fruit to quote unquote change where the former group would require legislative change to um, affect. So is there a way that you can divide that up into two buckets and does this, the ASNA requirements have anything to do with that? And I think that's for Justin or Jean, but maybe Emily. Do we have a ticker? Well, I can start. Yeah, I can start. Um, sorry, I was muted and had to come back live. So anyway, um, I, I think ASNA was real, the results of ASNA really let the FAA know they didn't dictate what metric to use, but they dictated that they were to choose a metric um, that had those three items in it that we talked about noise level, time of day, and number of events. And so that's, so the FAA then resulted in coming up with using use of the DNL. And so um, with that, around the same time, I will uh, let you know that also um, uh, Maryland, the state of Maryland and the state of California actually developed um, their policy, which was um, prior to the FAA. Um, and they also came up with DNL. And as you know, California came up with CNEL. So very similar type metrics. Um, and so it is really, you would have to change legislation for, in my opinion, for the FAA to go use a different metric. They would have to somehow undo ASNA requirements or modify them in a way that allowed for a different cumulative metric. And, um, and while some think and believe that that's only on land use compatibility issues or reasons to do that, but it really is more than that, I believe, because it was really Congress through ASNA said this, we want a single way to convey aircraft noise levels. Um, they didn't want 20 systems out there. They didn't want it to be, you know, a lot of different metrics being used. They really wanted the FAA to determine how they were going to convey the noise levels from aircraft to communities. And so I think that that would require legislation change um, if you wanted a different type of metric. Now, this doesn't stop us from using supplemental metrics, um, but it does just state that this is the one way that we're going to be conveying um, community uh, aircraft noise in the community through this type of metric. Okay. Uh, Linda, you have a follow-up question? No, I think I'm just going to digest that for a minute. Um, I'll, I think I'm... Okay, good luck. <laughs> yeah. Yes. There's a lot, there's a lot in that answer. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, see, I see your hand is up and I would like to come back to the timetable in a minute, but uh, and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, uh, Jean, thank you for that explanation. I'm looking at the ASNA requirements for a metric and your comment about supplemental metrics. We are still digesting the results of the ground-based noise study that looked at the topography that sits above SFO. So that would mean that what we found could be somewhat unique for any airports like ours that have this mountain that seems, and I'm saying seem because it's not, we haven't adopted the, the study. It seems that noise concentrates and gets worse as the sound moves up a hill and into a valley. So 
for in terms of this letter that has such a short turnaround time, if we can grab Justin, should we be looking at a supplemental criteria for topography around airports? And maybe an airport that's completely flat, like Denver, the last time, if I remember, it's way out, it's in the flat, its impact on low frequency noise could be significantly less than ours where we have this amphitheater effect. Um, so it wouldn't be mm -hmm. a standard metric, it would be supplemental. Question? Yeah. Well, I can. yeah. You want to go for it or you want me? Yes. Go for yes. it. Go for it. So there, there's really um, a couple issues there. And the first is that the FAA with their Aviation Environmental Design Tool or AADT has taken into effect terrain. You can actually turn terrain on or off, which would um, account for, and what's happening like um, behind start and takeoff roll at San Francisco, as well as some other airports like Boston and San Diego and places like that that have rising terrain near the airport is that the, um, the noise doesn't get reduced from following the ground. It's actually going up and the ground isn't reducing that noise as great as when you have flat terrain. And so that is the effect of why you get higher noise levels than used to be predicted out into communities that are higher in elevation than the actual um, uh, airfield. And so I hope that makes sense is that you're not getting the ground reducing the noise by the time it gets to um, elevated communities that are affected like sideline or behind start a takeoff roll. Um, so that's one of the issues. The other issue, um, again, if you talk about low frequency noise is that really nothing blocks low frequency noise. So it's going to, it's going to propagate out um, in hills as it does on, on flat terrain because nothing really, the ground, the buildings, things like that really um, don't reduce low frequency noise, which is why you know, on calm days or uh, days of low ceiling or, or fog, things like that, you will hear only low frequency noise because some of the high frequency noise is being more abated in certain weather conditions. And so then it sounds like it's even more low frequency noise when in fact the atmosphere is reducing the higher frequency noises. So I just wanted to point that out that there are actually two phenomena happening there. Um, one is the train by itself, and the other is the fact that very little stops low frequency noise. Well, Thank if you. we're just looking at, at a nighttime curfew, could we use what you've just explained, Gene, and thank you, that was really clear. Could we use that as an argument for bringing nighttime curfews? <laughs> well, that's a totally different argument. There, right now, you um, uh, I think you have to do, well, I know you have to do part 161 right now to do any curfew since the Airport Noise and Capacity Act was um, legislated through Congress, um, which is almost impossible to get curfews in. So to get a curfew in, you either need change in legislation or to go through a rigorous part 161, which is a noise and access restriction study um, in order to try to get a curfew. Um, and when you do try to get curfew, so again, most of my answers have two parts to them. The second part to this one is going to be about if you do want to try to get a curfew, then obviously you want to look at everything possible. And I think um, by all means, the low frequency noise and the fact that nothing you know, is able to stop that very well, that that could be a good reason um, you know, to include when you do go look at a potential curfew. Thank you. And thank you, Chair. Thanks, Al. Sure, thank you. I am going to uh, move it into public comment because I uh, we have uh, it's three o'clock now, and I want to make sure we have an opportunity to get some feedback from the public. Uh, I would ask the public. Uh, you don't forget, you mentioned you wanted to hear Kathleen. Just oh, I wanted good. to I'm gonna remind Kathleen. you. I'm going to move Kathleen to the end. That's okay with you, Kathleen. Um, uh, with respect to public comment, I would ask that uh, in your comments, if you have specific recommendations for comments you would like to see made. Please, uh, please lead with those or share those. So we got some specific items to work off of. Uh, one of the things that we will go back and look at is with respect to the different topics that are covered. And we are gonna try to find a way to have an opportunity to have the public look at this letter before it finally goes out. And I'll, I'll work with Michelle on that. So with that, do we have any hands raised? Thank you, Chair. And I did wanna get back to your question. Um, I looked it up and comments are due March 15th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. 
Okay, thank you very much, Angela. Yes, no problem. And we do have three hands raised. I will first call on Mary Jo Fremont, followed by Darlene Yapley. So Mary Jo, please accept this request, unmute your microphone and begin speaking. Thank you. I want to share two observations on the NES result from the NE symposium last week. One, nobody questions the results, including the FAA. And according to one panelist, the validity is not the issue, but more of an embarrassment issue for the FAA since they have known since the 1970s that annoyance levels on aircraft noise were much higher. And two, people did not ask for more research. They asked for urgent improvements. They also asked about the legality of continuing to rely on the 65 DNL, dB DNL threshold, given that no law requires the FAA to use that metric and threshold. Congress asked for a single system, not a single metric. Even though noise recognizes NES as a watershed moment, their response is that the FAA should conduct a large scale investigation of metrics and impacts over the next, next decade to determine the future policy for the FAA. I and other residents respectfully disagree with the noise recommendation. There is no need to study new metrics. Multiple non-DNL metrics already exist that accurately reflect the noise that people experience. They just need to be reported, which you can do today in ADT. In fact, the FA even encourages using these non-DNL metrics to communicate impacts with affected communities. So if these non-DNL metrics are good enough for communication, why can't they be good enough for decision-making? At the symposium, the authors of a recently published book who studied noise policy for 40 plus years share that we do not need more research. It will not affect policy and it will make us lose another decade or two. These were their words. And this, uh, to add to this, there is no need to study for decades the health, psychological or physiological impacts of aircraft noise. The studies already exist worldwide and they have shown the impacts. So the FAA must re react to the NES data, not with additional research and investigations, but with an ethical obligation to take urgent actions to provide noise relief. They can do this. They have the authority to do this now. They don't need Congress to tell them what to do. And in 1996, and I will finish, Congress relieved the FAA from its obligation to promote civil aviation. It is time for the FAA to promote the well-being of residents on the ground, given these NES results. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. Thank you, Ms. Fremont. And I, if I could just remind members of the public to state the city they're calling from. I will now call on Darlene Yapley, followed by Rob Holbrook. Ms. Yapley, please accept this request. I need your microphone and begin speaking. The refutation of the Schultz curve is a sea change for noise policy. Per lawyer Peter Kirsch at the symposium, it will be hard to get relief as long as 65 DNL is in place. And I just want to correct. Peter Kirsch confirmed that FAA can change the metric and the threshold. It does not require legislation to do so, which is why the panel gave me feedback to change my slides that said the FAA's interpretation of significant impact. So they can make that change. Uh, I propose five comments for these roundtable to make. Number one, the survey is rigorous and represents new reliable evidence. Number two, Factors contributing to the increase in annoyance, we listed several in a letter that we sent to the subcommittee. Number three, based on the refutation of the Schultz curve, the FAA has an ethical obligation to change regulations. The action is that the FAA should pro provide a timely roadmap for changing its regulations so that the Schultz curve is no longer used in environmental reviews in part 150. Number four, it is not necessary to perform research on new metrics. Instead, we propose three practical actions. FAA to make the NES data sets available by April. They've committed to make them available, but they're not available. Number two, FAA to perform a number above analysis using the NES data to show the relationship between N above and the percentage of highly annoyed people by the end of 2021. A sign of goodwill would be for the FAA to start using N above immediately. And by the way, SFO should start using N above in its monitoring reports. Significant impact must be redefined. We need an independent body to make a proposal and recommendations to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shapley. 
Next comment. I will now call on Rob Holbrook, followed by Aaron Macias. Mm -hmm. Rob, please accept this request. I'll mute your microphone and begin speaking. Thank you. <clears throat> the FAA has asked us for three categories of input. I'm concerned that by focusing the public on these categories, the FAA might be inviting us to join them in allowing the perfect to become the enemy of the good. We, we must not do that. Understanding can always improve, but meanwhile, decisions need to be made. I believe that policy should advance in phases with a tranche of research results followed by policy adjustments. The NES results and other recent publications should mark the end of a research phase. Now, we need the corresponding policy adjustments. The adjustments might not be perfect, but nothing ever is. It could be seven years before the next round of research completes. The NES study itself took eight years. And then that research round of research could be followed by three years for policy making and then five years for rollout. 15 years is just too long to wait for relief. By all means, let's respond to the FAA with specific suggestions for research. I provided several ideas for this committee to consider in the paper you received this morning and will be providing a lot more in my own comments to the FAA. But please frame your suggestions as good to be haves, good to haves, excuse me, to be considered in a future policy making cycle, not essentials that justify deferring the need to take action by adjusting policy now. We all pretty much know what the problems are and we don't need additional metrics uh, or a lot of additional research to convince us that action is needed soon. Um, I would add a couple of, I, I think I'm gonna finish there, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holbrook. Mr. Holbrook, if I can just have you state what city you are calling from, please. Oh, my apologies, I'm, I'm uh, in Mountain View, thank you. Thank you very much. I will now call on Aaron Macias. Please accept this request to unmute your microphone and begin speaking. Good afternoon. My name is Erin Macias and I'm from Pacifica. Um, I would like to say first that the impact is clearly fully documented and the NES graph survey demonstrates the FAA has a duty to respond. I agree with the other speakers that we need to stop wasting time studying it. I'd also like to comment on the duration. Duration is completely irrelevant if you are startled awake by an airplane at three o'clock in the morning. This happens to me every week when a cargo plane goes directly over my home. I have a defective heart valve and this is a chronic stressor in my life. It's a major quality of life issue. Um, I know that San Francisco has technical issues affecting takeoff and landing, but the planes need to ascend faster and not cruise the rooftops at such a low level. We do not need to study this issue again. Local input can be contributed to the solution and that is where our local energy should be spent. I'd like to echo the previous speakers, and I'd like to say that the, um, the data sets definitely need to be available sooner. Um, this is, issue has been going on for quite some time and studies are a known delay tactic. The FAA needs to be held accountable and they need to bring solutions forward so that we can have our quality of life back. Um, please, please do advocate for us by fighting these delays with more study, without more studies. We know the impacts on human health should be the driving decision maker in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Macias. Can I have you state your city, please? I'm from Pacifica. Thank you. I will now call on Jen. Jen, please accept this request. I mean, your microphone and begin speaking. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, like other speakers here, um, I have to say the FAA should not kick the can on this. They have a history, along with Congress, of simply initiating more research and stalling any sort of effective improvement, and that needs to stop. It's simply time for mitigation. It's time to do something. Um, for example, simple things like vortex generators can't even get through Congress. This needs to be pushed through. Technology needs to be worked on for fine grain dispersion. So we can go back to dispersion so we don't have rails, which are what caused nest results because of PBN and because of the frequency of flights over neighborhoods that are now terrorized. Neighborhoods that didn't have noise previously and now have hundreds of flights over them. 
We need graduated noise standards away from airports. For example, different noise standards at five miles from an airport, 10 miles from an airport, 20 miles from an airport in developing new flight paths. Supersonics are another issue. They want to move it back to an old noise standard. We need to make sure that when supersonics come or if they come, that they are based on the same noise standards as planes currently. One size does not fit all. And the 65 DNL is one size fits all. It doesn't work. We need more than research. We need more than just supplemental metrics, which simply explain to the public why they're being hammered by noise, but do nothing to help people. We need action right now. We need more than to appease the public or to explain or engage the public to explain why they're being hammered. Thank you. Thank you. And Jen, you're from Sunnyvale, is that correct? Sunnyvale, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will now call on Peter Gray. Peter, if you click on the Can you hear me? Yes. Um, my name is Peter Grace. I live in Brisbane. There's so much to comment on that I'll only make one or really two comments. I would encourage the legislative committee letter to comment on the FAA category that is missing. The rate of implementation of the NES results to the, regulate, to the FAA regulations. Darlene has reminded us what Peter Kirsch said at the Davis Symposium that the FAA has the authority to change the regulations and it doesn't need to be an act of Congress. So I hope that the effort, your letter, the legislative com committee letter will address the rate of implementation of the NES results. If I had more time, I'd like Jean to comment on the graphs on page 20 and comparing the Schultz curve to the NES curve and particularly the startling result for me Schultz says that at 75 dB DNL, pretty loud, only 35% of the people are highly annoyed. Yet the NES curve at, you know, says that 35% of the people are highly annoyed at 55 DNL. This is a huge change, a huge difference. And we need the letters and the FA, we need the letters to encourage the FA to step up and, um, and implement what they're meant to be doing. What I see is there's a body on this in the middle of the freeway that's getting run over. We don't need to work out what to go and do about the body. We need to do something right away now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Are there other hands raised? Yes, we have one more hand raised by Ms. Sue Degree. Sue, please accept this request to unmute your microphone and begin speaking. Uh, hey, uh, Sue Degree from Pacifica. So uh, the f I'm a bit concerned, and I would hope that the letter would say this, is that the turnaround for the public to make comments is like a sneeze away. And what if that symposium had not taken place when it did? So as the speakers before me have pulled out some very meaty issues that I certainly concur with, um, Trying to digest everything is very hard, and it's very. I'm very pleased that the public is speaking up because they were there. I noticed that FAA was also there, and uh, in the legislative part, uh, where Congresswoman Karen Bass, her uh, person that that was there, Jacqueline Hamilton, I suggest you review what she says because she reiterated what you heard from the public already, and I gave a few more strong statements. Um, the the history that we heard through this symposium that at one time the FAA was pretty much directed to be the marketing or the fostering, I think the word was, the fostering of the aviation industry. And that was pulled away 20 years ago. They are here for the public. The public and our elected people need to hear what's ailing us, how it's affecting us. And health needs to be up there with particulates and safety and efficiency. They're not the marketing tool for for profits. There are bodyguards. So please, could you force that? Thank you, Sue. Uh, other comments? 
Angela? Um, I saw a hand, but it looks like they put their hand down. So at the, oh, here it is. I will, oh, mm, Ken Miles, it looks like your hand's going on and off. And Mr. Miles, are you there? It, it doesn't the request to unmute your microphone. Can you hear me now, please? Yes, yes, yes. yes. I, I'm a resident of Pacifica. I've been flying in and out of Pacifica, I mean, out of SFO now for a number of years. And prior to next gen, we would uh, either fly up to uh, Delta during takeoff uh, over land, over water primarily, not over communities and going to the Pacific uh, Islands or Japan or, or China, we'd fly over the gap and out over the ocean and that was it. Now with next gen, we live in that situation somebody talked about where the planes are flying over, uh, over the hill, very loud, over the valleys. And I live in a valley and it's like a vibrator uh, drum inside the valleys in Valimar, a neighborhood as well as Rockaway and Lindemar their neighborhoods. And then it's, uh, uh, then they turn off and go either south or east. And other flights from the from the north are coming in for landings. Then we have flights coming in from Oakland that are leaving there to God, who knows where, and they're flying all over the place. So I want to say is I want to be able to have peace and quiet. And uh, we have to modify the flight path so that the planes are mostly over water, whether they're landing or uh, taking off. And by the way, uh, Pacifica does not have uh, an FAA or an SFO noise monitor, and we should have at least two because we're a long, narrow uh, community and nobody's really monitoring our, uh, our noise levels unless there's uh, making a complaint. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Miles. Are and, there other comments? Uh, Chairman, with that, we do not have any more hands raised. Okay, with that, we'll close the public comment or we'll close the comment section with respect to agenda items. Take it back to the panel itself. Uh, any questions or comments from the panel? I, I think we heard a lot with respect to uh, uh, comments that we should consider making. I think there's some unanimity over many of them. Are there any items in particular that you wish to, uh, uh, to comment on further at the panel level? the chair may i may i make a comment yes please pam um yeah I, this is my first meeting with the ledge um committee but in any policy i was wondering after hearing so many um different cities are heavily impacted i know brisbane and uh, pacifica and daily city but the, the heaviness of all is there an equitable component that's applicable to the to any of these policies or any of these studies to where it uh hits a lot of disadvantage uh, versus other areas, I know that to be looked into when they do the studies, um, because I think it's a responsibility that um, some people really have suffered quite a bit since I've been on the SF roundtable for a number of years. It seems like they're hitting, 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 and sometimes even increasing in certain areas um, versus other areas. I mean, I know that's a very complicated issue because it is the FAA and it is a uh, concerning the airport. And the other thing is, I remember uh, Mayor Schneider brought up the fact of uh, a possible curfew. And I believe John Wayne Airport has a curfew. I don't know how they applied for it or if they still have it. But um, if Ms. Schneider is uh, still looking into that, um, I believe that's one of the airports and what is applicable for that. I'm not sure that it's going to do anything. Other than that, um, that's pretty much what I have at this time and how to do our neighborhood. Thank you, Thank you Thank very you, much. Ma I, I, Thank you. I, I think your comment, particularly around the social justice aspect, may be a factor we want to highlight a little bit. It, it's not been mentioned in, the, uh, in any of the comments I've seen, but I think it's a critical one to highlight. So Thank I think you it's so well much. I think Thank it's you, well Chair. Taken. Thank you. Are there and other uh, comments? I'm sorry. Through the chair, through the chair. This yes. is Anne. I just I I know we've got Kathleen on the call. I know 
I am desperately hoping that our Congresswoman is gonna reintroduce her eight bills, but maybe Kathleen has something to add. That's a great suggestion. So let's move to Kathleen. Kathleen, I think that question's <laughs> been teed up for you. So <laughs> would you care to comment? Um, hi, thank you so much, Anne. Um, oops, I don't have all my setup. Um, the, um, I don't have any direct comment on, on, the, uh, on the letter writing. I think you've gotten uh, some great advice from um, some, some excellent experts. I think I can only echo what they had to say in terms of just write something. And you know, I, if it were me, I would urge them to um, move forward and do something instead of researching again and again and again. And I, I think that has to be one of the main thrusts. We just need to get moving on this. And I, I think we've all seen the FAA do study after study after study in the past, and, and it has gotten us uh, not very far. Um, as far as legislation from the Congresswoman, as uh, most, most of you may know, back in late 2019, the uh, Congresswoman introduced eight pieces of legislation having to deal with the impact, the negative impact of flights on our communities. Um, and as you may remember from uh, Government 101 or uh, one of those schoolhouse uh, uh, videos, um, when the two year, the members of the House are elected every two years as you likely do know. And at the end of that two year period, that two year term, the legislation dies a natural death. And so all the bills sort of disappear into the ether. So at the start of a new term, which was just in January, um, legislators are all looking at their um, legislative plans for the upcoming two-year term. And that's where the Congresswoman is at. She's reviewing all her um, uh, legislation, including her noise legislation. And I, um, I, I don't wanna speak out of turn, but I, I, I can, I cannot imagine that she will not be introducing some aviation legislation. Um, and right now that's under review with, with the Congresswoman as well as, as her DC staff for the most part and select people from the, the, from the district staff. And um, there's a process that's involved that has to deal with legislative council who actually shepherds the, the technical writing of them as well as the committees that have jurisdiction over them. So there's some conversation and back and forth going on, but um, I look forward to the next legislative meeting if it's um, when it's at, when I could present um, far more detail. Thank, thank you, Kathleen. And I, I do think uh, the next meeting may be appropriate to have you and a couple others to, uh, attend and debrief us on legislation that's being proposed so we can comment on it and think about talk about it. Could I, I would add one comment though, is the Congresswoman is considering the reintroduction of the eight pieces, which I thought were excellent initially, she may want to consider adding the component based around this NES study, because there's some information there I think would uh, may may stand on its own legs or may be part of the existing legislation uh, and modified. So you may want to. I will. I will take that to her as well. Absolutely, Al. Yeah. Uh, Anne, I'm sorry. Is your hand up? Anne. Darn that mute button. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Councilman Di Giovanni from Daly City. Uh, yes, San Jose also has a curfew. It's you're still relatively new to roundtable. We've heard the rationale. We can offline talk about that. I will say because we have Kathleen here that I am and my city therefore is investigating whether or not we can be recognized as an environmental justice community, which might give us a little bit more ability to get some mitigation for various noise attributes. And I don't wanna give airports an excuse to discount their noise because there's a freeway, but my city is uniquely impacted by seven different transportation agencies. So environmental justice and the other aspect for all of our cities, uh, one of the things under NEPA that I learned uh, at the symposium last year is if you have neighborhoods that are designated under the National Historic Preservation category, which are 50 years or older, it gives you a tiny bit of more grounds if an EI, uh, uh, EIS is state, EIS, EISs are being done. So those are two things we're trying to look at. Normally, I think a lot of San Mateo cities would not like to think of themselves as environmental justice communities, 
although almost all of us are becoming minority majority communities, which is part of the criteria, it's just not straightforward. And uh, as soon as I know more information, I'll report out. Thank you. Great comments. Uh, Michelle, with respect, we're, we're at 3.30 and I, I don't want to stifle the conversation. I'm cognizant that uh, meeting was scheduled in at 3.30, so I'm sensitive to that. But are there any additional feedback you'd like as we draft this letter? No, ultimately, it would be nice once you see the letter to maybe try to prioritize some things. So I'll, I'll do my best to draft what I've heard today and send it to you, and that'll give you an opportunity for comment and modification. Okay. I, I, would, I would hope if we could get the letter drafted, have the committee members have a chance to comment on it, and then after that, if we could somehow post it so the public can have a quick chance to make final comments before it goes to the executive committee for final approval, if we could fit that in the timetable. And I know the timetable is extremely tight and it may be worth a comment on that, by the way. <laughs> I think the, the, the uh, feedback uh, uh, is well warranted. Um, uh, but with that, and again, I would urge members of the public, I really appreciate the letters that we've gotten. If you have other comments that you'd like to be made, uh, even if there's one or two things that you think need to be highlighted or addressed, please don't hesitate to send them in the next few days as we draft this letter. It would be much appreciated. With that, uh, before we adjourn, uh, are there any other comments or messages from members of the panel? I, I had said we're going to have Mayor one Royce, last- I would just say, oh, Mayor Royce, I just say, well done. Well done. Great meeting. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, again, I did promise one last public comment. So if there's any last public comments, let's open it up. And I'd ask you to keep it to one minute on non-agenda items. Um, yes, I do see four hands raised. Um, okay. just give four, me four minutes now, four minutes, guys. Okay. I just have to change the time on my... Um... That, that's okay. Well, uh, I'm, I'm being somewhat tetious here, but go ahead. I'm going to first call on Jen. Um, so Jen, I'm sorry, I'm going to have the time on my phone really quick, but Jen, please accept this request. Unmute your microphone and begin speaking. Hi, um, just had a question on Wednesday. I know that there's a noise meeting and someone had mentioned that it's noise members and friends. So I wanted to find out how to get an invitation to that. And then secondly, I just had a, a quick comment. Living in the Metroplex, you have millions of people within the Metroplex, and I have always thought that noise needs to be prioritized over efficiency within a Metroplex, or at least at the same level as efficiency. And it was clear at the symposium that that was not necessarily the case, that efficiency was always trumping noise considerations. Um, and so that's something to consider when when the FAA is considering noise. Um, again, it needs to be prioritized, in my opinion, over efficiency or at least at same level. Thank you. Great. Uh, Jen, uh, Emily, you want to respond to the invite to the noise meeting? On yes, that? absolutely. Yes, members and friends are welcome. If you go, I think uh, Michelle has the invite, but if you don't have an easy way to forward it to folks, if the easiest way is to go to our website, which is aviation-noise.org. Great or contact Michelle. Okay, Angela, the next hand's raised. Um, Darlene Yapley, please accept this request. I'm in your microphone. Yes, the ASNA law of 1979 asked for a single metric, did not ask for a single metric. It asked for a single system and I'll send the law citation to everyone so you can look at that. They did not ask for DNL. Second, the chart that was cleverly packaged by the FAA Yes, DNL counts the number of events, but they average it over 24 hours. So that is why we cannot get an accurate depiction of our problems. Okay. So we have to be careful about the way these things are done. And lastly, this change the Schultz curve is a once in a lifetime opportunity to change the noise policy. We may not get this chance again. So I encourage the round table to be as comprehensive as possible to provide the feedback. It, unlike other letters in the past, it's not the three top things. You need to share all of the problems that are being experienced. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will now call on Aaron Macias. 
Hi, this is Erin Macias of Pacifica. Um, I, I really wanted to compliment you all on something that was mentioned. It was environmental and social justice. I have taught in San Bruno and South San Francisco, and I wanted to make mention of the fact that some of the schools where we have some of our poorest members of the San Mateo County, the most at-risk populations are severely impacted by this noise. And they have language and educational barriers that prevent them from having representation on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. And then I think you said, Angela, one more comment? Yes, we have one more hand by Mr. Rob Holbrook. Please accept this request and your microphone. Hi, thank you. Um, just a couple of points of clarification for items that came up today. Uh, first, uh, curfews were that existed in 1990 were grandfathered in. Uh, by the FAA. Um, but I do think that the change, the ability to impose a curfew is a decision that the FAA has power over under this part 61 review process that was mentioned under ANCA. So they could, I believe, change their position on that if they were disposed to. Second, the report to Congress that said takeoff speed doesn't matter. Well, that was true on average but I think it could be a tool that could be profitably used in ge geographies and demographics. Third, the 32 decibel reduction from the CLEAN program would be the sum of the decibel reductions on takeoff, arrival, and on the runway, which means that an average of 11 decibel reduction in each of those areas might satisfy. And lastly, for Mayor Schneider, EPNDB uses A-weighted average. Low frequency noise is discounted in the A-weighted weightings by 25 decibels at 63 hertz and by 16 decibels at 125 hertz. So if you're looking to capture low frequency noise, A-weighting doesn't do it. Thank you. Thank you. And I do have one more hand from yeah. Ms. Yes. Um, Sue Degree. Sue, please accept this request. Right, for the legislative committee, uh, as you can and as quickly as possible to the round table. At the symposium, it was mentioned the, uh, the helicopters of today are gonna be gone. You're gonna have vertical uh, taxis. And um, the other thing is the supersonics. I think those two things really need immediate attention or we're gonna have a next gen again uh, related to those two different items and also drones. I, I think we should not underestimate drones. So those things should be on the horizons for comment and research. So we avoid how next gen came in and, you know, it was, it was supposed to be the most wonderful thing ever. And we're all experiencing that wonderfulness. Yep. Thank you. Th thank you too. Well, much well taken. Thank you. Chair, with that, we do not have any more hands raised. Okay. Floor. Well, I want to I want to commend our public for keeping the one minute. That's outstanding and, and very substantive comments. So thank you very much. Um, at that, we're at 340. Uh, is there any last items for the benefit of the good for the members of the panel? If not, I want to thank Emily and Jean and Justin in particular for your presentations. Looking forward to hearing it again on, on Wednesday, Emily. Uh, and again, I urge anybody, if you have comments on this, please send them as quickly as possible. We'll try to get them incorporated, vet them through and, and figure a way to get it back to you so you can have some final thoughts before, before we finalize it. Thank you very much for your input. Thank you for your help. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Sue, nice to have you back. Hey, Sue.